Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank those who set all this up. I counted there's nine, for those of you who are on uh, Zoom land, there are nine easy ups here. We've got two Bose speakers so that we can, so I can talk normally without having to shout over traffic. And there's a, a mixing board over there. There's all kinds of stuff. There's a lot of setup to make this happen. And uh, I really, really appreciate that. Um, also, we have a fancy microphone. I like that. In 1943, John Steinbeck, Steinbeck, one of my favorite authors and a celebrated author at the time, joined the Army as a war correspondent. He was too old to fight because he was 41, but he wanted to serve his country. And he served as a war correspondent in England, Italy, and North Africa. And he wrote dozens of stories for newspapers all over the United States. While he was on the coast of England, he was at a B-17 bomber station, and he wrote the story, Waiting. And he wrote about the bomber squadrons that he saw there and the people that he had met while he was there. He wrote about the agony, the boredom, and the fear that the men felt between their missions. Now, once the mission started, these guys were okay. But in between, it was miserable. The wait in between was excruciating. They never knew when they were going to be called, where they were going to go, how dangerous the mission would be, or even if they would come back alive. And as Mr. Shem had mentioned in his um, split sermon, um, this is a weekend that we um, are honoring those who did not come back alive. And many, many, very sadly, did not come back. That's what Memorial Day that we're celebrating this weekend is all about. To help to relieve the tension, the men in the bomber squadrons would adopt the stray dogs that were hanging around the base. Each of the squadron had their own dogs, and they were very, very attached to them. A lot like we are attached to our dogs. I know that when we have our Zoom chats, people put up their dogs <laughs> while we're chatting. I know we do. We're guilty as well. Um, so I've seen you, and I've seen you interact with your dogs and, uh, and your other pets. But these guys, they played, and they doted on their dogs, and they taught them how to do tricks, all the things that we do as well. At the base, there was a little mound of dirt behind the hangar. And behind that, in that dirt behind the hangar is where the crew chief would stand with his binoculars, searching the sky for the bombers when they'd come back on from their missions. He would search with the binoculars and he would squint and strain his eyes trying to see the planes as they returned. Right beside him was a little gray and black dog, sometimes more than one of them. And before the crew chief could hear or see anything, that little dog would start shaking and start whining because he could hear what the crew chief could not. The dogs were right. Here come the planes. At first, there are little bitty dots in the sky. The dogs now are shaking even more, and they're starting to whine and bark with anticipation even more. When the moment that the plane wheels touch the ground, those dogs take off like they're shot from a bullet, each of them running to his own, to his own plane. The scene was repeated for each plane when it lands one by one. And every dog, as I said before, recognizes his own plane. And there's a happy reunion. The mission is over and the waiting returns. Let's turn over to John, verses 10, verse 27. John, verses 10, verse 27. John 10, verse 27. As I was... Uh, Reading the scripture made me think of this story that uh, John, Ste John Steinbeck wrote. John 10, verses 20, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, for they follow me. How did the, do the dogs know each plane and its crew before it landed? And as I asked this question, I thought of parallels to our spiritual life. To be that attuned to their crew 
and the planes that were attached to their crew, the dogs had to do three things. They had to listen to their masters, the bomber crews, very intently and be attuned to the sound of their voice and to their physical mannerisms as well, the unspoken sounds, so to speak, of their crew members. At this station, every crew flew the same plane every time. They didn't switch up. So they had to be attuned not only to the mannerisms and the physical mannerisms of the crew, but also the sound of the plane that went with that crew. The, the dogs had to know their crew intimately, what they liked, what they didn't like, and how to please them. And when they did please them, of course, the crew gave them rewards, attention, maybe scraps, scraps from the uh, mess tin, just like we do when we spoil our pets. The dogs also, the third thing they had to do was respond with enthusiasm. When the planes hit the ground, the dogs flew to the planes, ready to please their masters once again. So, in order for these dogs to have this kind of relationship with their masters, they had to do three things. They had to listen to their masters, they had to know their masters, and they had to respond to their masters. These three necessities of our spiritual life, listening to God, knowing God, and responding to God are of ultimate importance to us. So let's first examine the first one, listening. Every character who is described as being close to God in the Bible demonstrates this quality. I'm just going to go over to one of them, and so let's turn with me, please, to uh, 1 Kings 19, verse 4. 1 Kings 19, verse 4. And as I'm turning there, the, explain to you a little bit of the context is what is going on here. This is about Elijah the prophet, 1 Kings 19, verse 4. Elijah the prophet. And he was sent to warn Israel of their idolatrous ways. And they were deep into idolatry at this time. Their king and queen at the time was none other than Ahab and Jezebel. And Ahab, Jezebel, and the people, Jezebel and the people of Israel never listened to Elijah when he, was prophe when he was prophesying. As a matter of fact, they went about looking for any prophet they could find and killing them. And now they were after Elijah. So let's start reading in verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. That's kind of a juniper tree. And he prayed that he might die. And he said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. But... Well, as we see here, Elijah was fleeing for his life, and he was discouraged. He was alone, and he thought he was, or he felt like he was the only prophet left, and he probably was. No one was listening to him, and he felt like he was a failure. But God, as we read, continue to read past verse 4, God told him that he wasn't alone. God sent an angel to take care of him, uh, take care of him fed him twice. And when he got a little bit more strength, he journeyed 40 days to a cave. Now we can pick up reading more in verse 9. And there he went into a cave, and he spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord of God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. You can almost feel his, his discouragement in, these verses, in this verse. They have torn down your altars, and they have killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. He's still beat down, and he's still discouraged. Verse 11, then he said, go out, stand on the mountain before the Lord. This is God speaking to him. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks and the pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the, in the, but the, Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. In my margin, it says, a delicate, whispering voice. Elijah recognizes that voice. He doesn't recognize the other ones, but he recognizes that one. And he responds just like before. And uh, he says, 
you know what, God, I've tried really hard. They won't listen. They've killed all the prophets, and I'm next. But God says back to him, you haven't failed. You're not alone. Elisha, with an S-H, Elisha will carry on your work, and the king and queen will be punished, and Israel will be punished too. Then, reading on in verse 18, Yet I have reserved, God says, 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. God gives him a great deal of encouragement here. Just like the dogs at the base, Elijah knew his master's voice and responded. He was not distracted by all those powerful events like the wind, which is probably more like a tornado, the earthquake, the fire. Each one of those, Elijah did not respond. He knew God's voice, and those weren't it. Then the delicate whispering voice came, and Elijah said, that's it. And he came out of the cave and listened to that. And when he listened, God spoke to him. He loved him. He comforted him. And he readied him for his next assignment, which was training Elisha. The world that we live in is very, very loud, both, both literally with the traffic going by and figuratively. Society's voices do not reflect God's way. They're the opposite, but they disguise themselves very convincingly, don't they? Sometimes we can be tempted to nod our heads and go, hmm, maybe they have a point there, you know? Maybe uh, it is okay. We can love, love just anybody we want and not recognize that the love that they're talking about is erotic love, not the agape love. Oh, it's the same thing. And we can start thinking, oh, that's no difference. We can wrap ourselves in some kind of political agenda or another or be deceived that that's God's voice. We're not immune to that kind of deception. Even people who are religious, they can get caught up with the charismatic preachers who preach a health and wealth doctrine, emphasizing prosperity. Charismatic preachers who um, teach health and wealth doctrines. Christ's teaching, in contrast, was like selfless and meek, not self-serving and not self-centered. Our, self, our, our society worships affluence. We see that all around us. In Steinbeck's last novel, it was called The Winter of Our Discontent. It was about a man whose integrity was gradually worn away throughout the book by the society around him. He was constantly being tempted and encouraged to compromise his values and to worship at the altar of affluence. We must learn to discern God's voice as Elijah did. Let's turn over to Matthew 24, verse 24. Matthew 24, verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. The dogs at the base um, didn't um, recognize their master's plane. If they didn't recognize their master's plane, they stayed put. Through God's, through God's word, we can learn the sound of his voice, and we must learn the sound of his voice. And that sound of his voice must grow louder and louder in our, in our hearts to drown out the societies that it's all around us, evil values. We must know the sound of our master's voice. It literally is a matter of life and death. The second thing the dogs had to do to recognize the masters upon their return was to know their crews intimately. Turn over to Matthew 25, verse 14, just a couple pages over. Matthew 25, verse 14. Matthew 25 and beginning in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another he gave two, and to another one, 
to each according to his own ability, and immediately went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. The things I love about Christ's parables is they are so vivid, aren't they? I mean, you feel like you know these guys, right? You, sometimes I forget that they're not like, that he just made them up. But they are, but, but, but they're, they, because they're so vivid. Anyway, continuing on. Then he received five talents, went and traded with them, and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug into ground and hid his Lord's money. So he who had received the five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, Well done, you good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. Now I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then the Lord, then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is your, yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I have not scattered seed. Therefore, you ought to have deposited my money in, the, in with the bankers, and at least at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. There's three men highlight, highlighted here. Two had the identical reaction. No hesitation, no question. They knew exactly what their masters wanted done. The third guy had a whole, whole totally different view of his master. Verse 24 says, you're a hard man. Was he? He said, you reap where you did not sow, like it was some kind of a problem. I don't know. It seems like to me that the master was pretty generous. I mean, he gave some pretty, pretty good rewards, right? And Luke has said um, that he gave him rulership over cities. When I was in quarantine, a great big job came in. Now, while I was in quarantine, I couldn't get out. I couldn't go out and, and bid the job. I couldn't look at the job. I couldn't give a price on the job. I couldn't meet with the customer. And so I thought, what am I going to do? I don't want to lose this big job to my comp competition. So I called one of my employees, and he went out. And he bid the job. He met with the customer. He gave them a date when he could do it. And he gave them the price. He did everything. I didn't do any of that. And he did a great job. He got somebody to help him. He did it on time. Um, I paid him for the job, and I made a little bit of a profit. And I didn't lose a big job to my competition because I, because I had COVID. All because of a faithful employee who did not have a problem that I could reap where I did not sow. The first two guys in this story knew their masters intimately. They knew their expect, the expectation of his master and they responded to him. And they responded to him correctly. The third guy did not. He failed, I believe, before, long before he even buried, ever buried his talent. He failed because he didn't know his master well enough to understand the expectations. The result, a fearful and a false view of his master. Christ wants us to know him and to know his expect, the expectations. The more we know him, the better that we can please him. The dogs in this story that I was telling, Steinbeck's story, the dogs had a deep bond and attachment with their masters, and the attachment went both ways. Like Christ said in, verse, in John 10, verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I, know, and, I, I, and I am known by my own. If we are his, and we know him, and he knows us. So the second point is we must know our master intimately in order to please him. The third point centers around response. My favorite part of Steinbeck's story is the reaction of the dogs when the planes come back. I mean, they are 
out of their minds with excitement when the when the planes hit the ground. Let's look at a scripture that illustrates the kind of reaction those who have listened to and know Christ and the kind of reaction they will have at his return. Let's turn over to Luke. Luke verse chapter 12 verse 35. Luke chapter 12 verse 35. I want to read this from the New Living Translation. Luke 12, verses 35. I'm going to read all the way to 38. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning, as though you are waiting for your servant to return from the wedding feast. Then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. I tell you the truth. He himself will seat them, put on an apron, and serve them as they sit and eat. He, he may come in the middle of the night or just before dawn, but whenever he comes, he will reward the servants who are ready. Those who listen and who know God will be like those dogs racing to the plane. I had this image in my mind, in my mind of, the, of the pilots unbuckling all the safety harnesses and things like that and climbing, opening up the little door there the, of the, the windshield and climbing out onto the wing, climbing down and then hitting the ground and the dogs just like at 100 miles an hour racing up to them and jumping up at them trying to lick their face but they can't quite reach so they keep jumping and jumping and jumping and the, and the, and the pilots grabbing them up in their arms and holding them and twi twirling around and then maybe putting them back down on the ground and then maybe running and playing with them just enjoy that the mission is over the joyous the joyous reunion of the servant and the master but we are warned in scripture that not everybody's going to have that reaction Philippians 3, verses 18. Let's turn over to Philippians 3, verses 18. Verse 18. Philippians 3, verse 18. For many walk, of whom I've told you often, and now, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. We were like this before we were called and we gave our lives to Christ and received the Holy Spirit. These people have not listened to God. They don't know him. They don't recognize him. They spent their whole life focused on earthly things. Matthew 24, verse 30 says that the tribes of the earth will mourn at Christ's return. Why would they mourn at Christ's return? Because they have no idea who Christ is. They don't know him. Let's turn over to Revelation, verses, Revelation 17. Revelation 17, verse 14. And these will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will, will overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. They don't recognize him, so when he returns, they will actively oppose Christ and his government. Revelation 16, just a couple pages over, Revelation 16, verse 14. It... Um, sheds more, even more light on this. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of, the God, of God Almighty. The kings of the earth don't want to give up their rule. They don't, they don't recognize Christ. They think maybe he's some sort of space invader or something. They believe the signs the demons have, have deceived them into believing. Why? Because they haven't listened to the shepherd. They don't know him. And he doesn't know them. They have become, sadly, Christ's enemies. But some aren't openly hostile like the ones I just described. Some are just afraid. Let's turn to 1 John 2. 1 John 2, verse 28. 1 John 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. The New Living um, reads this way. Remain in fellowship with Christ, 
so that when he returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back in shame. Be absolutely ridiculous if the planes landed and the dogs and the pilots returned and the dogs just turned tail and ran away. Or they ran up to their masters and bit them. If we spend our life in our, and if we spend our lives in fellowship with Christ, it'd be just as ridiculous for us to have that reaction upon Christ's return. Our only reaction would be with eagerness and joy. We just finished celebrating the day of Pentecost, which is all about that fellowship. The next holy day is all about the reward of that fellowship. Let's turn once again over to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. Four, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from the heaven, from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel angel, and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and shall remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The choice has been laid before us. Are we going to listen to God throughout our lives? Do we recognize his voice? Are we able to discern his voice and pick it out amidst, amidst all the noise of this society that's pump, being pumped at us? Are we striving to know God? Do we know what he expects of us? Are we responding to his instructions? Are we taking the spiritual gifts that have been given to all of us and just taking them and running with them? Is God's character and love deep within us? Is it being reflected to those that we come in contact with? Not just each other, but those that we come in contact when we're at work or at school or anywhere that we might be. Will we be like these dogs, eagerly, eagerly anticipating Christ's return? Or, on the other hand, will we be like the others who are deceived or allow ourselves to be deceived? or become ashamed, or afraid, or worse yet, rise up against the Lord when he returns? The answer to that, to that question ha has everything to do with what we are doing now. We're not immune to the deception that's around us. Matthew 24, 24 says it. It says, false Christ and false prophets will arise and grow, show great signs and wonders, so as to deceive even the elect, if it was possible. Our job is to be that elect, so it's not that, so it's not possible. So let's look forward to the day that Christ returns, descending from the clouds. The day when we will be shaking all over in anticipation. The day when we will take off like we are shot from a cannon to meet him at his return. And the master will know his sheep, and he will be known by his own.